Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Dennis Rainey is a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, and we're quite proud of that. He's a committed follower of Jesus Christ. He's the husband of Barbara since 1972, the same year Barbie and I got married. He's the father of six children and papa to 19 grandchildren, all who live way too far away, in his opinion. He has served in ministry since 1970. He serves as the president and CEO of Family Life, a subsidiary of Campus Crusade for Christ, now known as CRU. Uh, Dennis' leadership has enabled Family Life to grow into a dynamic and a vital ministry that offers family blueprints for living godly lives and raising godly families. He's authored or co-authored more than two dozen books, including the best-selling Moments Together for Couples and Staying Close. In his spare time, he enjoys helping Barbara in the garden, reading great books, and pursuing his passions for hunting and fishing. Uh, Dennis, it's a privilege to have you on our board and as a friend. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Dennis Rainey? Appreciate you. Well, it's a treat to be with you. I have to tell you, one of the highlights of my four decades plus of ministry was attending this institution in the mid-70s, and I want to thank the faculty for your investments in students today because you just need to know we soak it up. We're sponges, and we appreciate you. I also want you to know it's a privilege to be on the board. I speak for them by saying we're all bullish on Dallas Seminary and believe its best years are yet ahead. I want you to turn your Bibles um, to Joshua chapter 1. I do host a, a daily radio program, Family Life Today, and it could be said in part that I make my living by asking questions. My favorite question is one that I ask, usually not of guests, although I have done that on occasion, but is usually around a dinner table where Couples may be seated, men and women mixed together, and I ask them what I believe is one of the most fun questions to ask a group at a dinner party where everybody is boring one another with each other. <laughs> It'll dislodge heroes among you. And the question is this, out of everything you have ever done in all your life, what is the most courageous thing you have ever done? What is the most courageous thing you have ever done? I want you to chew on that for a moment. I've asked that question now of thousands of people around the dinner table, and as you would expect, some of the stories that come out are incredible. Battlefield stories of guys grabbing grenades in midair and throwing them back at the enemy. Stories of phenomenal heroism, flying planes that are full of bullet holes, still on a mission. People who have confronted a father in alcoholism, stood up to a dad and left the family business to go in pursuit of a calling. Others have confessed to affairs. One recently on a military base said, my greatest act of courage was confessing my, to my wife of an affair and asking her for a second chance. But just two days ago in Washington, D.C., I asked the question of a gentleman over a lunch, and this pastor in the inner city came up to me afterwards, and he said, I didn't share it publicly but the most courageous thing I have ever done is forgive the man who murdered my 35-year-old son. What I have done doesn't begin to compare with that kind of courage. But do you know what the most oft-repeated answer I get to the question when I ask the most courageous thing you've ever done? Every time it happens. This is the answer. I've never done anything courageous. And I think the root of that answer is that we don't understand the word. 
Because courage is doing your duty in the face of fear. It's doing your duty regardless of the obstacle, and it's stepping up to make an impact. I wish we could somehow interview Joshua this morning. And we could turn to him and say, Joshua, what was the most courageous thing you ever did in your lifetime? Well, you might reflect back and think about when he was one of the 12 who went into the land and came back with the minority report of faith and belief that God could give us the land. You might perhaps answer the question in Joshua chapter 3 and 4, when he did in fact go into the land and piled those stones up as the Jordan River stacked up and the nation crossed and began to retake the land. I asked that question as I studied for our time together, and I came back to Joshua chapter 1 as the watering hole for what is courage and where does courage come from. And so I just want to read this passage and I want to make three comments about where courage comes from. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise. Go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory." Look at this promise. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Billy Graham has said, courage is contagious. When one man takes a stand, the spines of others are stiffened. Joshua had seen a man take a strong stand in Moses. But Moses was now gone. He was dead. And so God tapped Joshua to fill the sandals of Moses and lead the nation in to the promised land. I want to point out three, three, three places where courage comes from in this passage. I think it comes from a lot more places than just here. But in this passage, I think it clearly teaches three. First of all, it's found in verse 5 and 6. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. God gave Joshua a mission. He gave him a direct assignment that he was to fulfill. Um, I had never met Bill Bright when I uh, was in his office about 45 years ago, and he was not there. And there on his office at Arrowhead Springs in Southern California was a little wooden plaque of sorts, almost like a triangle, 
and it had a plaque on it that said, I'm no grasshopper. And I had a chance to meet Bill, and so I asked him, what's that about? I'm no grasshopper. He said, when the spies went into the land, they came out and said, and we became as grasshoppers in the eyes, in our own eyes, as we came out of the land. And he said, in the kingdom's work, I don't want to be a grasshopper. I want to be like Caleb and Joshua. I was to go to work with Bill some three years later and work with him until his death back about a decade ago. And I was with him early on in my ministry, and I had a chance to have kind of an informal time with him. And I said, Dr. Bright, have you ever, have you ever been discouraged and wanted to quit? And I will never forget this as long as I live. I was a young man in my late 20s, early 30s. He looked back at me with steel eyes, and he said, never. And I said, oh, come on. When those guys walked into your office and demanded your resignation, didn't you think about tossing it in? Never. I was beginning to get the point. Because I was sitting there as a young man facing all kinds of obstacles in my life, in my ministry, in my marriage, in my family. And I got to tell you, the thought of quitting had crossed my mind. But Bill challenged me to step up to embrace the call of God. And when you slit his veins, he hemorrhaged the Great Commission. Matthew 28, the greatest commission. Joshua was given the mission of going into the land. Jesus Christ gave us the mission of the Great Commission. And what did he promise? He promised he would never leave us or forsake us. He'd go with us as we are on this mission. A second place that courage comes from is found in, in, uh, in verse 7. It says, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded to you. This is talking about being obedient to God. When God calls a man to a mission, he calls him to strap on the armor of battle and not be hindered. As the author of Hebrews said in Hebrews 12, by the encumbrances around us or the sin, the baggage that we carry into battle. God has called us to carry, he has called us to carry a sword. He has called us to penetrate the culture, pierce it. I used to believe that there was no way in my lifetime I could go to jail for preaching the word. I used to say that. I no longer believe that. I think I could live long enough to go to jail for preaching the truth about what this book says marriage is. One young man who lives in this community, Tony knows him, his name is Brian Carter. I've had the privilege of being in a mentoring relationship with Brian for the past decade, one of the great privileges of my ministry. I'm driving down the road over by Love Field. I'd just been at a Dallas board meeting. I believe it was back in May. And I was on my way to catch a plane, and my phone rang, and it was Brian, who pastors Concord Church. And he said, I need your advice. I need your advice. He said, our president had just made headlines by redefining marriage as being between two people of the same sex. And he said, I really want to talk to my congregation about what God says marriage is. You know what he was calling for? He was calling for courage, for encouragement, to step up and to preach the scriptures. I don't know what you will face over your lifetime as you fulfill your mission of rightly living your life according to this book and of proclaiming this book, but I do believe increasingly it is going to cost all of us a deep, profound courage in our souls. I recently went to uh, Chuck Colson's memorial. This little dot on my lapel was given out to all those who attended. On this 
lapel piece is CWC 1931 to 2012. And it has this quote. Remain at your posts and do your duty. Courage is doing your duty in the face of fear. We just lost a Moses. Chuck Colson was a great ambassador for Jesus Christ. But he called us to live our lives for Christ and to remain at our post for the glory of God and for his kingdom. There is a third component of courage that is found in verse 9 there at the end of the passage. It's actually mentioned before this, but it's mentioned again in verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Sometimes courage is needed in some interesting places. When you're being a dad and you decide to go to your kid's junior high dance. And I decided, along with Barbara, we'd go inspect what we expected. And we arrived at the dance to a darkened cafeteria of a throng of young people all dancing in various styles. And all the parents were huddled up in the corner by the light, like bugs. <laughs> and as we walked in there, they said to us, have you seen what they're doing over there? Have you seen what those kids are doing over there? No, we just got here. Oh, it's disgusting. It's disgusting. So I looked and began to walk, walk over to the darkest place in the cafeteria where I found two young men with a girl sandwiched between them. It was called freaking. All right? Basically, it's imitating intercourse with your clothes on. And I stood there as a 45-year-old man with my hands growing clammy. And I thought, he's a 14-year-old boy, for goodness sakes. A pimple-faced 14-year-old boy. I'm 45 years old. I'm a grown man. What am I afraid of? And so I took two steps, and I tapped the young man on the shoulder, and I said, knock it off. That's indecent. And to the other young man, I said, come on. You know better than that. This is somebody's wife. You need to treat her with dignity. She's a woman, and she's going to be a mom someday. And I said, young lady, you ought not to let young men treat you that way. And say, oh, man, you've got to be kidding me. So they broke up. I looked over my right. Here comes the principal with a flashlight. And here comes the parents. The parents begin to invade the darkness. <laughs> Courage is contagious. Now, let me tell you something. The statement, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men and women to do nothing, has never been more true than today. We are in all kinds of skirmishes, battles, that demand us not to pull out our Bibles and thump people with them or the, hit them with the four laws, but to graciously step in and, and call people up to be salt and light and courageously push back against the evil that wants to prey upon our children and our grandchildren. If you don't believe this is true, read Isaiah chapter 59. I think it's about verse 8 through 13 or 14. It says, truth has stumbled in the streets and whoever does not push back against it, becomes a prey. The very evil we were meant to prey upon and to conquer and defeat with the scriptures turns around and comes at me and my marriage and my family and my legacy and my grandkids. Ladies and gentlemen, it's happening. And it's happening at younger and younger ages. I've now been on the radio multiple times across the country talking about Proverbs 5 through 7 in a book I wrote called Aggressive Girls, Clueless Boys. And it's about how girls are preying upon guys. 
the phone calls of moms of eight-year-old boys, eight-year-old boys, who have had notes stuffed in their backpack to have sex with them if they'll be their boyfriend and sit with them at, at the cafeteria. We may not watch the stuff on TV, but it is being watched by tens of millions of families and the kids that your kids and my kids and my grandkids are rubbing shoulders with. We have to train the church to know how to push back and to be courageous against evil. What causes me to do that? The third point, the presence of God. I'm accountable as a dad. I'm accountable as a member of the community to push back against evil and not just let it overtake our community. I'm going to close with the answer to the question, what is the most courageous thing I have ever done? And to do that, I'm going to show you a two-minute video clip from a new series we're creating for men, calling men to be courageous. Let's watch it. There are moments and seasons in life that a man can't possibly prepare for when he's dropped into combat without warning. I faced a season like that, a season when I was dropped into a battle that I hadn't signed up for, when I had to face down fear and embrace a different kind of courage to step up and to lead others through the valley. Our daughter, um, Rebecca, and um, her husband, Jake, gave birth to their first firstborn child. Her name was Molly. We called her Mighty Molly. It was clear from the beginning that uh, she had serious medical issues. In fact, she only lived uh, seven days. I, uh, I knelt beside her, and uh, I read her a letter that I'd written to her. Mighty Molly, I just met you. I feel cheated. I don't want to say goodbye. I, I know I'll likely see you in a couple of decades or so. In light of eternity, it won't be long, really. Still, I don't want to say goodbye. Your seven days sure brought a lot of joy to your mom and dad's face. Your parents loved you well. God couldn't have given you a better set of parents. Courageous parents. They have loved you with a sacrificial love that only a very few little girls like you ever get to experience. I love you, your papa. In the seven days of Molly's life, we were all allowed to spend a little time and um, one of the things that I did was I have her handprint on my life verse Psalm 112 1 and 2 praise the Lord blessed is the man who fears the Lord who greatly delights in his commandments his offspring will be mighty in the land the generation of the upright will be blessed. I don't have a lot of possessions that are uh, priceless, but this is one, my Bible. I was called to do my duty in the valley as a uh, man, husband, father, and a grandfather. Men, God's gonna call you to do some courageous things. And what he does, regardless of the assignment, do your duty. By way of application, I've got three questions for you. What's the most courageous thing you've ever done? Share it with someone today. Maybe your spouse, maybe a friend. Just share it and ask them what their most courageous thing is.
Secondly, answer the question, who's your Moses? Who are you catching courage from? Third, what's the issue or the area of your life right now where you need to be courageous? Let me pray for you. Thank you, Father, for the clarity of Scripture, for the mission you have given us, the Scriptures that call us to holiness and to a life of obedience and that we have the privilege of teaching to others. Thank you, Father, for your presence, each of these that give us courage to do our duty. And now I pray that your Holy Spirit would help each of us in this auditorium do our duty. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.